Someday, 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 someday. time factor probably be slightly different from where you are. But uh, for those of you in our media search, wherever you are in the world, good afternoon. And for our Golden Heights and all of the members of the body of Christ down south, uh, we certainly would um, uh, be remiss if we did not salute you. And we are just so grateful that you are listening and that you are watching our presentation from uh, the Golden Heights Church of Christ here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And if you are ever in the area, uh, just know that you have a standing invitation to share with us. Now, of course, during the pandemic, it's a little different. You know, we're closed down as well as thousands of churches across this nation uh, are closed down. Uh, because of what you already know. But uh, during uh, the time that uh, we uh, are permitted to uh, worship, uh, not necessarily permitted, but will uh, be meeting with our particular congregations across the nation, uh, just know that you are welcome here at the new Golden Heights Church of Christ. So for all of those of you uh, who are members of the body of Christ, not only around the world, but specifically uh, the new Golden Heights Church uh, membership, we want uh, you to just realize and never forget that we love you and we appreciate you. We are thankful for you. And we could not do what we do if it were not for you. Want you to know that. And uh, the ministers of this church and the uh, very powerful member, uh, ministries of this church uh, depend upon uh, you. And, and you have been absolutely uh, accommodating uh, throughout this period. We are not sure how long this period uh, will last. It uh, may be elongated as it has been from time to time, uh, but you, uh, and your love for Christ and your love for Jesus Christ and for the gospel 
uh, getting around the world, uh, you have not failed and you have not faltered in your support. So we would ask that you continue to support the work of the church uh, for the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to thank you so much uh, for that. Now, uh, 2 Timothy chapter number 4, 2 Timothy chapter number 4, um, and verse number 1 is where we have been. Now, uh, I'm trying uh, my best uh, to close this out, uh, but each time I go back to it and take a look at it, I say, I think I want to tell the church about this as well. And, and so as a result, then we are on a whole new venture uh, in terms of illumination uh, by the Holy Spirit from the reading of 2 Timothy chapter number 4. So those of you who have your Bibles, turn quickly to 2 Timothy chapter number 4. We're going to go in there and we're going to unpack some things that we have not unpacked before. And uh, so uh, uh, we'll be back to that. Uh, in just a moment. But right now we're going to pray. We're going to pray and we're going to ask everybody to bow their heads and, and uh, let's go to the Holy Father in prayer. Our Father, uh, ruler and super ruler of the universe, we come before you now recognizing that you are God and beside thee there is no other God. We recognize and we are grateful for the fact that you woke us up this morning, you started us on our way and you did even more than that, our Father. You allowed us to wake up in our right minds, uh, knowing right from wrong. And we're just so grateful and thankful for all that you do for us. You watched over our family. You, uh, you uh, watched over our relatives. Uh, you awakened us to a brand new day. And we thank you for that. And, and we never forget to thank you for saving us through Jesus Christ. For we recognize that there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So we just thank you, our Father, for all that you do. We recognize and have faith that you would do even more if we would but keep our hand in your hand. Bless our world, our Father. Bless the rulers of our world. We pray for them that they might rule wisely so as, so as not to bring chaos and destruction upon us all. Thank you for Jesus who hung, bled, and died on the old rugged cross for our sins. We thank you for giving us your son to die on the old rugged cross. Now for Christians everywhere, uh, not only in our, in our church, at the Golden Heights Church, but in our media church and in, in our worldwide church, all across the nation, of uh, those who are members of the body of Christ, we ask a blessing on them. Uh, we ask that you bless them and give them what they need for what they need it for. And we pray for all of those in the body of Christ who are sick and afflicted and shut in, shut down and shut out. And we pray not only for them, but we pray for uh, all men everywhere, all women everywhere who need you in this very trying hour. We need you, our Father. And we recognize that you do your work through us. So strengthen us that we might be able to do what it is we need to do in order to get what it is uh, we need to get. And we ask all of these blessings in the mighty name of Jesus who walked the lustrous waters and come the raging sea called Lazarus from the grave. Said yes to the cross. It is in his marvelous name. Amen. God bless you for being with us. Now for those who... Uh, have come in uh, in our media church. We want to thank you so much uh, for being with us uh, this morning and sharing with us in this message. Paul writes to the young man Timothy. Uh, he writes to the young man Timothy uh, in, in chapter number four, and I'm going to read this, and I know we have been uh, uh, talking about it uh, for the last couple of Sundays, but uh, there is always some things that you don't see when you first read because the Bible is so powerful and the Bible is so filled with the Holy Spirit of God and, and, the, and, and the Holy Spirit of God just illuminates our mind. Uh, when we go back to the same verse or the same chapter, uh, we find out, whoa, praise the name of Jesus. I didn't see that before. It's the power of the Holy Spirit illuminating the word uh, for our 
understanding. Paul says, now I charge you. And we've already talked about that word, so I'm not going to stay there. I charge you, I commission you, I implore you uh, to therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead. Now let me just deal with, uh, because I'm leaving this now, I assure you that uh, I'm moving past this and we'll try something else uh, next Lord day. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the quick and and the dead. Now, I told you to highlight before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I wanted you to highlight that because the reference there is to the judgment. That's the reference. Paul is saying what I am encapsulating, uh, what I'm encapsulating uh, to you in these verses and in this uh, commission, what I am saying to you I'm saying to you with seriousness, and I want to tell you how serious it is. Uh, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how important this is. I charge you in their presence, and I need you to know that I'm giving you this charge in the presence of God and his son, Jesus Christ. So whatever this charge is, brother preacher, whatever this charge is, Sunday school teacher, whatever this charge is, those of you who teach and those of you who preach, understand it. Understand the weight of it. Understand the weight of this charge. This charge is so powerful that, uh, that, that Apostle Paul said, I charge you. In the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the presence of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So when you preach, when you teach, when you minister, just know that heaven is watching and that heaven is listening. And that one day you're going to stand before the judgment bar of God and give an account of what it is that you've been preaching and that you've been teaching. So you cannot teach are these personal idiosyncrasies. You can't, you can't preach that. You have to preach what the Bible uh, uh, requires you and qualifies you to preach. You can't preach your feelings. You have to preach the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ. And then Paul says, now before the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge? Here we are now in the judgment. I give you this charge, young man in view of the judgment. Don't you dare try to preach without understanding that every word that you say and, and everything that you do, you're gonna have to give an account of it when you stand before the judgment bar of God. And all these things I've told you uh, from chapter one of 1 Timothy to chapter two to chapter three, the chapter four, all the things I've told you, I'm charging you now to preach against those things. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. I need you to attack those things. Uh, he says to Timothy in, in, in chapter number four, he says, now it shall come to pass in the latter times that some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrine of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience saved with a hot iron. That time is going to come. That time is going to come. And I charge you, young man, I charge you, preacher. I charge you, elder. I charge you, brother deacon. I charge you to make sure that my people are clear on what it is that they must do in order, in order to be pleasing in the sight of God. I charge you, and I tell you, I'm elucidating to you, I'm enumerating to you the things that you're supposed to be watchful about and over. And then he said, now, uh, this charge is so important that you're going to have to stand before God to give an account as to whether you did it properly and whether you did it according uh, to his word. And he said, now, uh, preach the word, be ready. I'm reading from the New King James. Be ready, in season, out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort 
with all long suffering and doctrine. If you're going to be a preacher, if you're going to be a gospel preacher, you got to preach with vigor. You, you got to preach with strength. You, you got to preach with love. You, you have to preach with courage. You have to preach with faith, knowing that without faith, it is impossible uh, to please God. Let's go back now to verse number one. Verse number one is going to help us close out uh, this whole chapter. Because what Paul wanted us to know and what Paul wanted us to do uh, as people of God, he packed it in verse number one of 2 Timothy chapter number four. So we, we want to go back now to verse one of 2 Timothy chapter number four, and we want to unpack it uh, so we will have no misgivings about uh, what Paul is saying to the young man Timothy. I charge you, we've already talked about that, therefore, therefore, we talked about that. Paul said, I charge you, therefore, because of what happened in chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, first Timothy, because of the horrendous things that happened, because folk were departing from the faith, because folk were preaching false doctrine. Paul said, because of that, I charge you. Don't you dare do it. Don't you dare do it. Don't you dare allow anybody to cause you uh, to not worship God properly. That is in spirit and in truth. Be careful about that. And, and then he says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's the judgment in, that's in view here. Understand that. It's the judgment that's in view in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now, there are other things that comes out of, uh, uh, of chapter, t chapter 4, but the conversation that Paul is having with this young man, Timothy, is uh, a judgment appearing uh, episode. We, 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 Paul is trying to make sure that Timothy understands uh, not only the importance of preaching the truth and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, but he, he wanna make sure he understands that you gotta give an account in the final roundup of human affairs and, and there are gonna be some, uh, that some things you have to give an account of. You can't just preach what you feel and uh, you can't praise your way into heaven. Uh, you got to be sure you understand what's going to get you into heaven. And uh, that's a whole nother subject, but you need to understand that. We miss that. Uh, but that's okay. Lord willing, we'll get to all of, all of those, uh, all those kinds of things. Uh, who would judge the quick and the dead? Again now, uh, th this is a judgment scene. Th this is a judgment scene. Uh, the, the preaching of the, of the preacher is so important that God set him uh, in, in, uh, inside of the judgment scene. He said, that's the way you see yourself. See yourself preaching a doctrine that's, that's, that's so true uh, until uh, when you stand before God, uh, you will not have a problem with what you preached. Be sure that your, the doctrine you preach is so solid. And it is so biblical that that will not be the thing that keeps you out uh, of the gates of heaven. Who would judge the quick and the dead? Now, because this is the judge, because this is a judgment scene, it means that the quick and the dead is part of the judgment scene. So when we talk about the quick and the dead, we're talking about this judgment scene. Understand that. Don't forget that. In other words, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4 now, in verse 1, right on down through verse number 8, Paul is talking about a judgment scene here. And the reason he brings up this judgment scene is because he wants the preacher and the teacher to be so cognitive of the importance of preaching the Bible that he mentally takes him metaphorically to the judgment scene in the final roundup of human affairs. So that's what he does. So brother preacher, brother teacher, brother elder, you make sure that your teaching and that your preaching is commensurate with what's in the Bible. 
and, and make sure that it does not veer off from uh, contrary to these things, these things, these things that Paul told Timothy uh, to preach. So now, the quick and the dead. Now, the quick simply means to be alive. That, that's what it means. Generally, that's what that word means, to, uh, to be alive. Uh, to be emboldened with life. That's what, that's quick, alive. Doesn't mean that you, that you can run fast. It means that you are alive. So he says the quick and the dead. Now, when we get to the word dead, it is obvious. Quick is to be alive and the dead is to be non-living. So dead is just the opposite of quick. Quick, you are alive. Dead, you are dead. You're not, you're not alive. All right, so death is just the opposite of quick. Now don't forget where we are. We are before the judgment bar of God. And we are before the judgment bar of God because of what we teach and because of what we believe. So it's important that what you believe and what you teach is recorded in the word of God. That's important. Very important. Don't let anybody tell you, believe what you want to believe so long as you love the Lord. That won't get it. That will not cut it. It's got to be according to these things that we find recorded in the word of God. So now, the quick and the dead in this text is talking about the judgment and the resurrection at the judgment. This text is, this quick and the dead references the final roundup of human affairs. The final roundup, which is the judgment, the final human uh, roundup, the final judgment. When you and I will stand before the judgment bar of God, Get that in your mind. There will be a judgment. I don't have time to deal with it, but there will be a judgment. For the Bible said, Paul says, we all must stand before the judgment bar of God. We all going to stand there. I don't want to go into that, but that's important that all of us realize that this life is not the end of our existence. So I want to be sure you understand that. If you want to preach this false doctrine and if you want to engage in false worship and, and if you want to veer away from the one faith and the one Lord and the one baptism, you have a prerogative. And if you want to exercise that prerogative by doing what you want to do, irregardless to what the Bible says, then you are free to do that. Except that Paul said, don't you forget, you're going to have to give an account of all those things that you impose upon the people of God. You're going to have to give an account of it. So that's what this text is doing. This text is talking about how important it is to stay within the word of God. That's what this text is saying. Because there was going to come a day when the quick and the dead is going to be raised from the grave. Let me get over that, uh, to that quick and the dead, because that's what this text is doing. This text is pointing us to the resurrection of the dead. And this text is saying that all of those of us who have passed on one day will be resurrected. And all of those of us who will be alive when Jesus comes that's the quick. That's the quick. According to this text, that's the reference. Because there will be those of us alive when Jesus come back again. So Paul puts them in this, uh, in this portrait. Paul says, before the quick and the dead. In other words, when Jesus come back, and he's coming back, in the final roundup of human affairs, when he comes back the second time, there will be those of us 
who will still be living. And we will be referred to as the quick, alive, when Jesus comes. But then there will be millions upon millions upon millions upon millions of folk who have died and are in the grave. What Jesus says, those who are alive, those who are quickened, those who have been quickened, those who are alive, will not go with him back to glory before the dead gets up. The dead's going to get up, but, and, and the live is going to go back. Uh, the, the, the qualified live, uh, live is going to go back with Jesus when he comes on the cloud, when he comes, Matthew 25. Uh, they're going to come back, Matthew 24. When he comes back, we're going to get on the cloud and go back with him. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15, 16, and 17. We're going to get on the cloud and go back with Christ, but not until the dead gets up. And we will not, those of us who have lived the life that Jesus has, uh, has required us to live, uh, we won't go back with him until the dead gets up. And so the quick and the dead is going to stand before God. And I don't have time to deal with those, uh, those judgment scenes. But the quick and the dead is going to stand before God. The quick would be those who, who are alive when Jesus come back. The dead would be those who died before he came back. They're going to get up. And then let me just announce this. I praise the name of Jesus. Let me just announce this. There will be one resurrection. There will be but one resurrection. There won't be four or five resurrections. There's one resurrection. Now, that one uh, resurrection, which we call the general resurrection, will have two parts to it. Now, get that, because that's important. There will be, when the trump of God shall sound, when the trump shall sound, everybody that's dead in the grave is going to hear that trumpet. And they're going to come out of there. That is the dead. Christians who are dead are going to get up. Sinners who are dead are going to get up. In that resurrection morning, when the trump of God shall sound, the dead is going to get up. The righteous dead and the wicked dead are going to get up. When are they going to get up? When the trumpet sound. Well, when the trumpet sound... What's going to happen? The, the graves are going to open up. The graves are going to open up. And then what's going to happen? Those who are dead, righteous and unrighteous, will get up. But now I just proposed that there will be only one resurrection, one general resurrection, only one but it will have two parts to it. The dead in Christ shall rise first. And then those that remain will also get up. But just one generation, that will, or one resurrection. There will not be a lot of resurrection all over the world. Just one resurrection. And so it's important to understand that dynamic. Now, when is that going to happen? That's going to happen at his appearing. There it is in the verse. When is that general resurrection going to happen? At his appearing. There will not be a lot of resurrection all over the world. Not one. And in that one will be two parts. The dead in Christ will get up first. And then the wicked will get up. And then we will be judged. That's what he's talking about here in verse number one. This is a judgment scene that Paul is handing to us here uh, in 2 Timothy chapter, uh, chapter number four. And so the dead will be judged, the righteous will be judged, and we will be judged with how we treated each other. We will be judged based on how we live. We're going to be 
we're going to be judged. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead. I've, I've talked about that. At his appearing. Here we go. I'm trying my best to close out this, uh, this fourth chapter and it's just getting more difficult. But let me, let me, let me do this. At his appearing. Now that's the, that's, that's, that's the, uh, that's the third appearing of Jesus Christ. You see, now I don't have time to deal with all of that uh, because I got three fingers up here and, and that means three appearings, three appearings. At his appearing and kingdom. His first appearing was of course when he was born and the 33 and a half years that he lived on this earth. That's the first appearing. Second appearing, we see him sitting, uh, seated beside the Father, making intercession for those of us who have, uh, who have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then the third appearance is actually his second coming. That third appearing is his second coming. And that's what you have here in the fourth chapter of Second Timothy. At his appearing. So now, let, you see, uh, I started to let me apologize, but I'm not going to apologize. It's just that there's just so much in here. There's just so much in here until it's difficult to get it all out uh, in, in a 30-minute in a uh, presentation uh, or a 60-minute presentation or 120 minutes present, presentation. But let me just say this. At his appearing... When is this judgment going to do? Now, I've explained the judgment to you. I've explained it to you. I explained the judgment scene to you because that's what he's talking about. He's talking about the judgment scene. That's what he's talking about. Well, when is he going to judge the world? When is Jesus Christ going to judge the world? At his appearing. Now, of course, you must understand that the kingdom at his appearing and kingdom. Jesus is going to come back for the kingdom. When is the judgment going to be? When Jesus comes back for the kingdom. Now, let me just say this, and then I'm going to stop, and then I'm going to maybe start here next time because there was just so much needs to be unpacked in 2 Timothy chapter number, uh, chapter number 4. At his appearing and his kingdom. Highlight that. Highlight it. At his appearing and kingdom. Highlight that. Now the second thing I want you to do, I want you to circle the word at, A-T. There's no way you can get around that at. And all of those who teach that Jesus is coming back and he's going to set up a kingdom and he's going to reign for a thousand years on earth and, he, 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 and he's going to reign from David's throne. I said circle at. For the Bible says at his appearing and kingdom. When he appears. When he returns for his kingdom. That's what that at means. When is judgment? That's what that at is for. At his appearing and his kingdom. And there is no way anyone would be able to get a thousand years in that at. There's no way we or you or I could get a thousand years or ten thousand years uh, in that act. Act there means simultaneous with his coming. At his appearing. What is he going to do at his appearing? What is he going to do at his second coming? At. Not set up a kingdom a thousand years. Well, what's he going to do at his coming? He's going to judge the world because God has made him, has given him charge of the judgment. Then what is going to happen after the judgment? 
Those of us who have lived the, the life that Christ requires of us to live, we get on the cloud and we'll go back with him to meet the saints who've gone on before in the air. And there we will, we will forever be with the Lord. No, no thousand years in there. Because I just told you what he's going to do at his coming. Now I've got to quit this, but here again, I want to thank you for being with us and, um, and sharing with us and uh, having church with us this morning. And, and, and I'll open up, if the Lord say so, uh, right here uh, on next Sunday, because I have to say, and I have to tell you uh, about the dominions of the kingdom. Got to tell you that. See, the, uh, the kingdom of God in his, in his first dominion and the kingdom of God in his second dominion. You got to understand those dynamics. Because in what Jesus is doing in 2 second, second Timothy chapter 4, Jesus is in the second dominion of his kingdom. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through uh, verse 1 through 8, we're in the second dominion of the kingdom of God. And you need to understand that God's kingdom has gone through a first dominion and it will go through a second dominion. And when Jesus comes again the second time, that's the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ in its second dominion. Because that's when it's going to occur. And I'll give you the scriptures to prove that. And you've been just fantastic. God bless you for being with us today. Wherever you are in the world, God bless you and God keep you. And let's look forward to uh, next Lord's Day. Let's look forward to next Lord's Day. Uh, as we get some, some good information from 2 Timothy chapter number 4 and, and verse number 1 and, and just show how far-reaching uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Uh, a different look at 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 1. Now we've always quoted it, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the we, We've heard that all of our lives, but I'm not too sure you heard what I just went over. And when I get to the first dominion of his kingdom and the second dominion of his kingdom and all of that is right there in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I'm not just sure that you realize that. And you may, you may have. And if you have, then good. Then we can enjoy each other um, as we elucidate uh, from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through verse number 8. Now, Golden Heights, what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, we're going to have communion. And if where you are, and if at the breakfast table, where you are, you, you're in the sitting room, wherever you are, uh, Golden Heights, just know we love you, and not only do we love you, uh, it is a privilege to commune with you. It is a privilege to commune with you. Uh, and we're going to commune together. So if uh, in your domicile, if in your uh, house, if in your home, uh, you were there with, uh, with your husband, with your wife, with your family, uh, uh, one or two more, whatever the situation is. Well, we're going to commune. And, uh, and, and we know why we're communing. Because on the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. So we know why we're communing. communing. So let, let's now... Uh, commune with the Lord. Uh, if you have the utensils there, then we would ask you to pour or open and, um, and, and take the bread <coughs> and the cup. Now let me pray for these. Um, Holy Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for what he did on the old rugged cross. Thank you, our Father, for his endurance Thank you, Holy Father, for his dying and for his love. And bless us now as we take this bread and as we take this cup. We pray, our Father, that you will strengthen us to want to be better next week than we were this week. And help us to visualize, if but for a moment, 
what the blessed Savior did on the old rugged cross. And we give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Now just go right ahead, uh, Golden Heights, and um, take the bread, take the cup, and we will do the same. And then don't forget now, uh, your offering for the church that we might be able to maintain all that we do. It's been a pleasure. Now, um, Media Church, all of those of you all around the world, and just know I'm looking at your comments. I don't all the time, but I do look at your comments. And, um, and I'm, I'm glad that somebody is still out there who who heard me preach uh, back in the day. Most of them have gone on to, going on to, uh, to be with the Father. But every now and then I get a comment uh, from someone who said I was, uh, I was uh, in that tent uh, on George Pepperdine campus uh, in Los Angeles, California. Wow, okay. God bless you. Or someone would say, I was in that big under that big tent in Oklahoma City where over 100 folk were baptized. Well, thank you for remembering, and I just appreciate it. And then there are those of you whom I have baptized all across this nation. God bless you. And then all the alumni of our church, and we have a ton of them out there uh, in the world today. And I want to say to all of our alumni, Golden Heights alumni, that was baptized in this church, but now you all over the world, we're just grateful uh, that you are tuned in and, and that you are listening. You know what's going on here. You know how it looked. You know how the auditorium looked because it was in this auditorium that you were baptized for a mission of your sins. So it's just great to, I just wanted you to know that I'm paying attention. And for those of you in Africa, those of you in Ireland, those of you in the Bahamas, those of you wherever you are, God bless you. And just know we love you and stay strong, stay strong. And always remember that the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. God bless you. God keep you until we meet again. Well, I shout you, Lord, Lord, and there's no doubt for heaven. I'm going to sing praises to your holy name.